Amen. Please have a seat. Thank you for being here today. We are going to have a good time as we launch a new sermon series. How many of you would be honest and say you were tired of the guardrail series? See, good. God bless you. Well, as we promised our children last weekend, we took them hiking after a Sunday afternoon or after a, our Sunday worship experience. We took our girls hiking to Sarah's Crack. How many of you have been to Sarah's Crack before? Yes, it's, it was fantastic. It was fun. And you would know that the trails are marked clearly by colors, right? There's the purple trail that leads to something, and there's the blue trail that leads to something else, and there's the yellow trail that leads to Sarah's Crack. So... I really kind of blew it last weekend. We don't need no stinking instructions, right? <laughs> like, hey, we just, we'll just wander around, right? We'll just meander. So uh, we, we took our girls to Sarah's Crack. There's a picture of us that we, we finally made it. Uh, I realized that sometimes last weekend we were hiking to Sarah's Crack. Other times we were hiking to Lizard Face. Liz Lizard what? Yes, exactly. Other times we were hiking to the lake. We were just wandering. We were meandering. The girls were choosing the trails. So sometimes we were walking circles. Other times we were walking straight. But we walked forever. Our, uh, our youngest daughter is five years old. And she dressed herself for her hiking outfit. And this is what she selected. Right? And this is exactly what Jesse looked like after she realized we weren't even halfway through. <laughs> we successfully took about a two and a half mile hike and I turned it into five miles. Way to go, Dad. We had one Nalgene of water with us. I blew it, right? I blew it. But the whole time, at, at first, Jessie was hopping and skipping and wearing her pink tutu. And then she realized that we had a long, 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 long way to go. So we had to backpack her out of Sarah's Crack, as well as uh, our other girls as well. This weekend, we are launching our new sermon series called Next Steps. Over the next four weeks, we're going to reflect on the question... What does God want to do with your next? Kind of a little bit of a philosophical question, kind of a little bit of an ambiguous question. We're asking, what does that mean? What does God want to do with your next? Well, if you are a follower of Jesus, you know that sometimes we don't follow Jesus very well. Sometimes we can be stubborn and we can be resistant and sometimes we can be not very intentional about our next steps. Like as I walked to Sarah's Crack, I wasn't very intentional about the direction that I chose. Yeah, let's go this way, or let's go that way. Or you want to go up the hill? Let's go up the hill. You want to go down the hill? Let's go down the hill. And I wasn't intentional about the destination. We were just wandering. At times, our journey with Jesus can be the same way. Now, don't, don't mistake don't mistake what I'm saying. I, I love Jesus. I love grace. I love his word. I love people. But sometimes I'm not as intentional as I ought to be. Uh, I wander and I respond to situations. I wander and I respond to uh, what life throws at us. But I'm not assertive about my next step. I claim to be a follower of Jesus. And as a follower of Jesus, my claim must be backed up by action. It must be backed up by an assertive next step. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter 2, 21 tonight. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible there at the seat in front of you. I want to encourage you to take that Bible home with you if you don't have one. It is Calvary's gift to you because we believe that if we read God's Word, God's Word will change us. In fact, why don't we demonstrate how many of you have been changed by God's Word before? Raise your hand. Okay, so that's what we're saying. If you're a first-time guest, if you're new here tonight, take that home and begin to read it. You will experience life change. We're going to look at 1 Peter 2, 21 tonight. Peter writes this, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. This is the passage of scripture that we've kind of taken this series and we're going to run with this. Over the next four weeks as we talk about next steps, we are trying to define what it is that God is calling you 
to do with your life next? What season of life are you entering and how will you bring glory to God next? When it comes to following Jesus, you and I always have a next step. Uh, If we have made Jesus the boss of our lives, if we have trusted Christ as our Savior and Lord, if we've experienced that life change, we have been called to follow Jesus into that next step of our life. That's the next step in your marriage, the next step in retirement, the next step with your children, the next step with your grandchildren, the next step in your area of finances, the next step in serving in the church. It's the next step. What is God calling you to next When we became followers of Jesus, we began a journey into the next. We don't know where our faith is going to lead us. We don't know what God is going to do with us. I don't know how God is going to work next in the lives of my children, my daughters. I don't know how God is going to work next in my relationship with Jesus and my relationship with my wife. But I know that the more I apply God's word, the more blessed I'm going to be. God has not called me to stand still. God has not called you to stand still. We are not meant and designed and created to be stationary or to be sedentary. We are not designed to sit still. God has called us to follow Jesus into the next. So, what is my next step? Right? That's the question. That's the question that you ought to be asking. It's the question that I need to be reflecting on myself. What is God calling me to do next? Well, have you taken the next step in baptism? It wasn't exciting to hear Phil's testimony tonight about how he had become a follower of Jesus and how he messed up and now he's rededicating his life to Jesus. Is that not all of our stories? I mean, that's, that is all of our stories. We've all, as we become followers of Jesus, we've all blown it. We've all messed up at times. But has God taken, have you taken that next step in baptism? You became a follower of Jesus. Maybe it was even last weekend that you became a follower of Jesus. But at some point, as a follower of Jesus, God is calling you to be baptized. He wants you to be baptized. Jesus was baptized by, the, uh, by uh, John the Baptist, and he went down into the water, and he came up out of the water. And Jesus wants all followers of his to be baptized as well. It's just simply signifying that we are his follower. We're not ashamed of him. He's changed us. He's given us new life. And so we want to follow him. Have you taken the next step in regular Bible reading and prayer? Many of us have become a follower of Jesus, but we've never really sat down to walk through the Bible and read through the Bible. At Calvary, we're encouraging, to read, we're encouraging you to read through the entire New Testament this year. Have you begun that journey? Are you, if you've begun that journey, how can you take it deeper? How can you walk with God in a deeper way as you read his word in prayer? If you're a casual reader, reading it every now and then, maybe God is calling you to take that next step and dive deeper, do something more systematic, more detailed. That could be your next step. But everyone is going to have a next step. Poor little Jessie, as she walked through that canyon, knew she had to take next steps in order to get out of the canyon. And she was angry at me about it. But that is the way that we live our faith life out. God is calling each of us to take another step, regardless of where we are. If you have the most meaningful deep relationship with God through Jesus, through prayer and Bible reading, what's your next? What is God calling you to do next? 1 John 2, 6 says this, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. I say I live in God, but my next steps aren't always in a biblical direction. Sometimes my attitude toward my wife is terrible. Sometimes my attitude toward my girl's homework stinks. Sometimes uh, I've not been the best friend that I need to be to other people. Maybe I haven't helped out when I could have helped out. Maybe I haven't listened when I needed to have listened. My steps aren't always in the right direction. Even as a pastor, I experienced this a few years ago. Let me tell you a story about a time when I failed to take that next step that God was calling me to take. A time I did not trust God like I should have. I received a phone call from a church family member that 
they had accepted an adult child, really an adult child, into their home. He was 25, 26 years old and had been addicted to drugs and his family had turned him out. And so they had brought him into their home believing that he had quit that lifestyle. He told them that he had quit that lifestyle. And so they embraced him. They loved on him. They encouraged him. They accepted him. And then they found out that they had been lied to, that he was stealing money from them and he was purchasing drugs with that money. So they called me and they said, Pastor, do you, do you think that we've taken the right next step? And I said, what is it? They said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna kick him out of the house. I said, you've done everything that you could. He broke the trust. You know, I, I agree with that step. So maybe about five months later, at the back steps to my office, I, I pulled up and there was a, a man sitting out there. He looked homeless, he looked disheveled. I'd never met him before. I didn't know who he was. And I didn't have time for him. I didn't have time to sit down and talk with him. I was too busy, I just didn't want to. So I called one of my staff members and I asked them, said, hey, there's somebody outside, would you go talk to them? About, about a year later, this same young man overdosed and killed himself, accidentally. It haunts me that I did not take time to take that next step. It haunts me that I, that was my next step. That's what God, that's a moment that God had designed and prepared for me and I blew it. I passed it on to somebody else. I asked someone else to take my next step for me. Raise your hand if you ever have regret about not doing something more in your past. Yeah, and aren't you grateful for God's grace? Yeah, grateful for mercy, grateful for God's patience, grateful for God's understanding, grateful for God's love. But the fact is, God is calling us to take a next step. I believe that I failed at that mission that God had given to me. Over the course of this sermon series, we want to help you discover what God is leading you to do in your next how can you be more intentional, uh, atten intentional about following Jesus? Now we're going to take the next rest of the message and we're going to focus on mission. W what is our purpose and what are we here to do? Well, at Calvary, you know that we have a very simple mission statement. You see it all the time. You see it on everything that we print. You see it on the video screens as you're waiting for worship to begin. Our mission is to lead people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and through the power of his truth. Now, I want you to know something. That's not something that Pastor Chad sat back and said, hmm, this sounds like a good idea. This, this sounds like a great idea. Let's go with this. It's not something that the pastoral staff said, let's, let's create our own mission. This mission is built on God's word. This mission of our lives, of our, as our life as a church, is based on what Jesus expects his followers to do. After Jesus was crucified, after Jesus rose from the dead, and before he ascended into heaven, before he left the earth, he met with about 500 disciples, and he looked them in the eye, and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is where Calvary has developed this idea of a life changing relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's, it's where we've derived our mission. It's a beautiful, simple truth that God communicated to his disciples, that Jesus communicated to his disciples, this is what you will now do with the rest of your life. This is it, is communicating the life-changing gospel, the gospel of hope, the gospel of grace, the gospel of mercy. That's it. This is our mission as a church. It's your mission as an individual. But there's a simple truth that we often overlook, and it's something that I'm guilty of as well. I have been the pastor that has stood and, and tried to help people get motivated to share the gospel, that even if nobody else does, you go out and share the gospel, that you are responsible uh, to verbally communicate the hope that we have 
in Jesus. But Jesus did not hand this mission off to one individual. He didn't pull uh, Peter aside and say, hey, look, all the rest of these guys are flakes. They're going to blow it. But on you, you are responsible. He said to all 500 to go out. He spoke these words to the whole group of men and women. He didn't speak to only one. He spoke to all of them. And he said to all of them that they were to go out together, that Jesus sent the disciples on mission together. It's important for you and I to realize that followers of Jesus are not on mission alone, that you are not a lone ranger. You are not on a solo mission or a mission impossible. I want to speak to my generation, if I could, for just a minute. I, I, I was born in 1973. I graduated from high school in 1991. If there's anything that I learned, now that was my BC days. It's before I became a Christian, before I became a follower of Christ. But if there was anything that I learned from the culture of music at the time, it was that, the, uh, the, that this idea that the rebel was the person to be. The loner, the outcast, the, the guy that comes in, it, it saves the day and rides off alone. That was my idea of what an individual ought to do with their lives. Uh, the lost and lonely figure was romanticized. Tom Petty, Bob Dylan, Billy Idol, rock and roll bands like ACDC and Guns N' Roses, they all had a part in shaping my generation to think that we ought to do life alone. You may recall the song, uh, Whitesnake sung a song in 1987, and it kind of captured uh, that, that idea. The words are, here I go again on my own, going down the only road I've ever known, like a drifter I was born to walk alone. Th this idea of loneliness, this idea that we are in life alone and by ourselves and nobody else is really there with us or for us, that we're alone, we fight alone, we do life alone, we are all we have, don't depend on anybody else, depend solely on yourself. We, we became convinced that that's how we ought to do life, at least that's how my generation thought, it's what we learned through music. And I somehow thought it was sexy too, right? I mean, we just thought we romanticized it and that's really what we thought. Don't share your feelings. Don't share your heart. Don't share the, the, the stuff that you struggle with. You do life alone. And somehow within the church life, my generation incorporated that into evangelism crusades. We incorporated that into the life of the church that, uh, that you are to live for Jesus even if nobody else will. That you're personally responsible to share the gospel with others or they will die and go to hell. Like We would take that responsibility of evangelism, the responsibility of mission, and take that burden and say, look, nobody, even if nobody else does, you follow Jesus. Now, now, that, that is a truthful statement. That is accurate, but it's not biblical. We are not called to fulfill the mission of Jesus by ourselves. My, my generation is resistant to get involved in life groups. My generation is resistant to sit down and have a conversation with, a, with another individual about what's going on in their lives. We're resistant. We, uh, uh, we, we, we don't want people to get close to us. We, we think that if they get too close to us, they're not going to like what they see. We, we're afraid that we'll lose this romantic image of ourselves as the drifter, as the loner, as the rebel, that we are to be swimming upstream against the culture. But God does not expect that from followers of Jesus. God does not want us to fulfill the mission alone. We complete the mission together. See, we complete sharing the gospel together. We, com we complete sharing the uh, hope that we have in Jesus as a body of believers together. In 2018, Calvary saw 178 individuals baptized 
Because they, they said, hey, I've become a follower of Jesus and now I want to be baptized to show the world. But they did not choose to become a follower of Jesus based on one thing alone. The truth is they chose to become a follower of Jesus because the people of Calvary have been on a journey of evangelism together. In 1972, a group of people gathered together and prayed and formed Calvary Baptist Church. If those individuals had not taken that next step of faith that God was leading them to do to launch a church, even those 178 individuals from last year would not have taken their next step in baptism. So how do we participate in the journey of mission together? How do we participate in the journey of faith together and the journey of sharing the gospel together? I want to share with you six ways that we as a body of Christ complete the mission of Calvary and Jesus together. And it's not going to be long. We're going to, we're going to hit these six things and jump right into communion. But you're going, to real, you're going to realize if you've ever felt guilty for not verbally communicating the gospel, if you've ever felt ashamed that you've not led somebody to Jesus, I want you to realize today that you have been part of the evangelism journey. You have been part of the mission of Calvary. Let's, let's jump into this. I think there are six next steps in our mission. One is passive support. You may have never verbally communicated the good news of Jesus. You may never invited anybody to worship or to an event. Uh, in fact, you may have kept everything about following Jesus private. You might read God's word, but you may not talk about Jesus at all to anybody. You don't invite people, but you've still been involved in the mission to lead people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. How so? Well, through passive support, support, you've been financially supporting the ministries of the church. You've been financially supporting the mission of the church through giving. You make regular contributions and gifts to the church, thereby supporting the ministries, the building fund, the mission trips, the ministries of the church. And the reality is we could not be one church in three locations if people weren't giving. And so you see that you are active in evangelism, even in your giving, even if you don't tell other people about Jesus. Why? Because we're a body of Christ and we work together. Secondly is by active support. Maybe you're serving in an area of Calvary. It might be that you're volunteering in the student ministry or the children's ministry or the uh, nursery. Maybe you're serving in the guest ministry. You may not be talking about Jesus verbally, but you are actively supporting those who are. You're actively supporting Robert as he works with the high school students. You're actively supporting Mitch as he works with the five, six, uh, the, the middle school area. You're actively supporting those who are verbally communicating the gospel. We need that. That's how the body of Christ works together. Another step is promoting evangelism. You may be the event guru. You love to volunteer for events or service projects in the community that help promote the ongoing mission of Calvary. You're outside the walls of Calvary, shining the light of Jesus through your good works, and you're representing Calvary in a very positive way. You're wearing the Calvary t-shirt. You're loving on people. You are, you are involved in the mission of Jesus as you are serving in our community. A fourth step is invitation evangelism. You are the one who is constantly living a lifestyle of invitation. Every time your friends see you, they have to come up with an excuse on why they can't go with you to church, right? You, you are that invitation guru. You're always inviting your friends, family, neighbors, coworkers to Calvary for worship or for any type of event that we have. You are the smiler. You are the encourager. You're the promoter. You're the inviter. And in fact, you feel uncomfortable if you don't invite a friend and bring them with you to worship with you. See, you're involved, even though you may never talk about Jesus, uh, even though you may never share, verbally communicate the gospel, you are inviting others into an environment that has experienced a life-changing truth of the gospel. You're involved in evangelism. The fifth step is story evangelism. Uh, the story evangelism. You share your story about how Jesus changed your life. You can't wait to talk about, man, let me tell you what Jesus did in my life. You talk about how you, how you were that old, crabby, mean 
you know, hearted person, but how Jesus changed you, how he gave you hope, how he forgave your sins, how he gave you new life, how he restored your marriage, how he restored your relationship with your children. You talk about that, that story of evangelism, how it's unfolded in your life, how grace has unfolded, how hope has un unfolded in your life, and you share that truth with others. You can't do life if he hadn't changed you, and you make sure that everybody around you understands that. And then finally, there's that the classic evangelism. Now, this is the evangelist that I would probably feel most comfortable being. It's the preacher. You're the preacher to your friends. Uh, beyond sharing your story, beyond serving in the church, beyond supporting events, you are the preacher. You are the scripture quoting, gospel sharing, people loving person who shares a gospel presentation with others and invite them to that relationship with Jesus Christ. You invite them to respond. You share the gospel, you share hope, you share forgiveness, and then say, what do you want to do? Would you like to give your life to Jesus right now? See, that's, that's what we would refer to as a classic evangelism, but all six of these steps are necessary as a body of believers. All six of these steps are necessary if we're going to fulfill our mission to bring the life-changing truth of the gospel to people. If we want people to experience life change, all six of these steps are important. Let me ask you a question. Of those six steps, which are you and where is God leading you to go next as you fulfill the mission? Which one are you on now? And where is God leading you to take another step in? Is it in support? Is it in passive? Is it active? Is it, uh, is it a classic evangelistic approach? Is it through your story? We've seen the stories of, of life change that God has brought through video after video after video in our worship services and online. What is your next step in the area of fulfilling the mission of Jesus as we partner together to share God's hope? How is God leading you next? Inside your bulletin that you were given, we want to encourage you, if you pull out the card, it was inside the bulletin, it says, my next step in the mission of Jesus is to Invite three unchurched friends to Calvary between now and Easter. So here's a way that we can all participate in that invitation where we're the inviter is to invite three unchurched friends. If you don't have any unchurched friends, go make some unchurched friends. <laughs> They're going to like you. You have a winsome personality. Right? You can do it, right? Go invite some unchurched friends to sit with you during the worship service that you attend between now and Easter. What we'd like for you to do is write their name in, in just a few moments after, during our communion time, uh, during our time of worship, write their name down and begin to pray for them and begin to ask God to give you that opportunity to invite them and commit that you will take the next step to fulfill the mission of, of Calvary, the mission of Jesus through Calvary by inviting three unchurched friends. Now, is that simple? How many of you say, man, I don't even have to pray about it. I know I've got three unchurched friends. I'm going to invite between now and Easter. How many of you would say that right now? Okay. Oh my goodness. All right. I've got to go back to page one. We all have an unchurched friend. So it might not be three, maybe it's two, maybe it's one, but you write them down and then you begin inviting them to attend any of our worship services between now and Easter and you watch and see how God will change their life. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer.